Well, hello everybody and welcome to chapel today. Um, it's so good to have you here and it's so good to be in worship with you. Um, today we're going to be looking at the friendship of uh, Barnabas and Paul. We're going to be looking at um, what their friendship was based on, how it grew, and um, what led them to going their separate ways. Um, and while we do that, I want um, to invite you to connect your awareness to those friendships and those organizations that you've been a part of um, that have led to you having to go your separate ways. Um, so as we um, settle into worship tonight, I want to just invite you to go ahead and relax into your chairs and just start taking some easy breaths. Remembering that each breath um, is the breath of God. We'll take our first deep breath right here together, breathing in and breathing out. Again, breathing in, breathing out. Finally breathing in and breathing out. So as you're thinking about those conversations, the ones that led to you going your separate ways, what does your life look like now because of it? Reading this text makes me wish I could be a fly on the wall just to observe their conversation. Just to, you know, analyze this disagreement. I want to see, you know, their level of maturity. I want to know um, specifically what are the things that they weren't able to agree on and why. Because the way their story ends up, when I think about what reconciliation means for me, um, it seems that this separation that is inevitable because of this disagreement is either the opposite of reconciliation or another variation of it. I wonder what you think about that too. So what comes to mind when you think about the process of reconciliation? This could be on a two-person scale, small or large group scale, or it could be on a human collective scale. Does it look like um, the unity that exists um, even in the distance between the moon and the sun or the ocean and the sky or um, even the tree and its branches, right? I think about um, the different de denominations that are represented in Christianity and all of the schisms and the splits that we've known, even some of the recent ones that we've known about that happen in denominations, right? all of these different branches coming from the same root um, and existing still as the whole. So when I was reading uh, Peter Block's section on having conversations that count, I wondered about the ways he spoke about dissent and what it could mean to allow space for that in a healthy dialogue and conversation. And just a quick reminder about what dissent is, um, here's a definition of that. It means to hold or express opinions that are different from, that contrast from, that conflict with those previously or commonly or officially expressed. So an easy example of that would be someone saying, hey, don't you just love this tie? Don't you just love this dress? Everyone says yes, and then someone says no, and it specifically says their reasons um, why. Now, in the conversations that you have day to day, in the one that Paul and Barnabas have, what could a healthy conversation look like um, when it incorporates dissent? Now, Peter Block offers these questions as um, ones to think about that could make for healthy conversation that incorporates dissent. Because what we're really inviting into the room when we invite dissent is truth. Um, we want to offer it in ways that make people feel more comfortable um, and brave when they share truth, um, especially in community. So some of those questions are these, what doubts and reservations do you have? 
What is the no or refusal that you keep postponing? What have you said that you no longer really mean? What resentment do you hold that no one knows about? What forgiveness are you withholding? And finally, what is a commitment or decision that you've changed your mind about? So from these questions and just thinking about reconciliation um, and dissent, um, branching out, um, growing up and growing out, just thinking about that. See if you can apply any of these questions to our focus text today or even some of those friendships um, or relationships that you've made in organizations. See if you can apply it to those as well. Right now, I want to um, just invite you to pray with me as we move deeper into worship today. God, thank you for the ways that you show up for us. Thank you for your presence with us always. Thank you for the deep breaths that we take, the ones that we take in you. God, I ask that you would bless this service and everyone who's gathered, everyone who's connected to to those who have gathered and, and even beyond. Comfort us, strengthen us, bring clarity to our minds. These things we ask in your name, amen. Hey y'all, I'm Mackenzie, and I'm going to be reading the scripture for this week from the book of Acts. Then after completing their mission, Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem and brought with them John, whose other name was Mark. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Siren, Manian, a member of the court of Herod the ruler, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Come, let us return and visit the believers, and every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul decided not to take with them one who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not accompanied them in the work. The disagreement became so sharp that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and set out, the believers commending him to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Hey everyone, my name is Blake. Would you please bow your heads and join me for this week's evening prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together this evening. We gather here today to give thanks and praise your greatness. We pray that you fill our hearts, our minds, our souls. Transform us, Lord, and make us more like you. We pray that you take away any stress and anxiety that we may have about anything. God, we pray that you watch over us and bring us comfort as we near the end of the semester. We pray that you bring us the strength, motivation, and passion to finish strong in all our classes and final exams. And Father, we thank you for all that you provide for us on a daily basis. Now hear us as we pray with confidence as our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Students, you're in the home stretch. You can do this. I believe in you. Uh, And if you need somebody to talk to over the weeks ahead, know that we chaplains, we're here for you. Uh, You'll see that slide. It was before service. It's after service. You'll see uh, Dr. Ward, Reverend uh, Tony Kindred, uh, Reverend Williamson, myself. Uh, We're here for you in this last bit. You're loved. You can do this. Uh, One of the things I've been doing with students in these kind of conversations we have is I've been going on walks around campus. 
And you may have seen me doing this with some students and uh, for a couple reasons. One, don't want Ronan to get the best of us. Got to get outside. And, and, um, and two, just the ability to have a conversation where you're walking is lovely. I was walking with a student a couple weeks ago, and uh, it was during, or this was maybe a week ago, it was during this just incredibly tense political season, and this guy said, uh, Preston, I've, I've just had to uh, defriend and unfollow so many people. I'm getting some amens, I imagine, in the breakout groups right now. you got somebody like this, you just unfollow, defriend, do you want to hear their voice anymore? Uh, older alumni, moms, dads, um, those who may not know what I'm talking about, there's this thing you can do on social media if you're just tired of hearing someone's voice. If you can't put up with it anymore, you, 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 just, you, know, you just defriend them. You, uh, you just unfollow them. And like, it's like, oh, it's, it's gone. It's gone forever. I, I, I never have to hear it anymore. It's Ah, <sighs> I asked the student why, um, why he did this, because I'm, I'm curious for two reasons. There's, there's a bad and, and a good of this. I think that the bad is that you see that you can just create your own little echo chamber, your, your own little siloed world where you fed your own politics and ideas back to you. You don't have to put up with any disagreement, and we just reflect the divide in our culture and world. There's no compromise. There's no understanding one another. I just like, I can, I can hear my own ideas back to me. It's, it's so nice. The good of it, though, is probably this, is that social media, maybe we realize we're never supposed to have this many friends. Uh, you, you only, like, really can handle so many friends in your life. And that our online lives are not our real lives. I want to take us into one of the most ultimate defriending things that happens in Scripture, and it's in this relationship between Paul and Barnabas. And I think it's helpful for us because one of the hardest things I think in college is to figure out who really is my friend and how do I become a good friend. So I want to share some of that, how it's prized at its best. I want to do a little Bible study to get deep into this. And, and I want to also at the very end show what some of the things that creep up in us that can harm our friendships. And we've got to pay attention to them because they can end friendships, even the best of them. Uh, last spring, I shared this uh, about uh, how the Bible talks about friendships, and I think right now, and I'll share this again, we've, we just have such a poverty of friendships. We're one of the loneliest generations, not just my generation, but it's, it's becoming more pervasive, lonelier than ever, sadder than ever, more depressed than ever. It's because we don't know how to be friends. We, for one reason, we, we prize rugged individualism above all else, that I've done it on my own, I've succeeded on my own, I've grown by myself, and we've forgotten how to be together. Go back and read Bowling Alone, that text from years ago. Not, we just don't know how to belong to one another anymore. We prize our own self-actualization above being with other people and growing together. I love what Tim Keller says, too, uh, about looking at societies and what they love. In the Bible, there's four forms of love. There's agape, self-giving, sacrificial, divine love. There's eros, erotic love, romantic love. There's storge, family love. And then there's philia, friendship love. And, and he says that in more conservative societies, you see storge, family love, love of family, that nuclear family get lifted up as one of the highest loves. In more, uh, in more secular societies, you see erotic love getting lifted up as the most uh, highest form of love. And if you don't believe me, like just go walk through a grocery store with your mask on and, uh, and just see the magazine covers. It's all about who's and what romance with who. And, and we all just sort of like, ooh, that's curious. I want to hear more about that. It's ridiculous. And, but, but like the Bible, it, the highest form of love is agape love. And actually where it shows up best, maybe best is in friendship. Uh, follow it into scripture. It's amazing. And, in the beginning, it says, let us make humanity in our own image. And it, at the very beginning, it's showing that God is, 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 is some kind of we. It's, it's a relationship. In Christian tradition, we talk about God as a trinity, and it's not a math problem. The trinity is reflected that God is relationship itself. And when we're in relationships in the right way, we're not, we're not just believing in God. We're practicing. Uh, we're, 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 we're living in God. We're, we're, we're finding our being in this God in whom we live and move and have our being. It's amazing. We become co-workers with God. We're in the world as God is. It's this living reality of being immersed in God when we do relationships well. The scripture says, let us make God in our own image, or let us make humanity in its own image. And it said that Adam needed a companion. 
it's not primarily about erotic love. It's about philia. It's about companionship. It's about friendship. It's about having someone to have life to do with. And because everybody needs somebody sometime. It moves on, and there's Abraham, and the way that God expresses God's appreciation for Abraham, and Abraham's faithfulness is saying he was a friend of God. I move up to Jesus. When Jesus sends disciples out on ministry, what does he do? He sends them two by two, realizing that everybody's going to need somebody sometime. You can't do it on your own. And then when Jesus wants to lift up his love for his followers, he says there's no greater love than this, than for one to give his life for his friends. And I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. It's as if when agape, divine love, wants to show itself in the world, it does it through friendships. And we've lost the art of this, and we've got to come back to doing it, of learning how to be friends to one another. I've not, I would say that a friendship at its best, it's somebody who always lets you in and never lets you down. And that, you may sound like, wow, that sounds incredibly difficult and impossible. And the point isn't to perfect it, but are you, are you progressing toward that? friendship. Paul, Barnabas, uh, they practice this. This is amazing. The, the story of Acts, it comes up to them, and they're like the splash brothers of evangelism, man. They're like, they're like Clay Thompson and Steph Curry, and I hope I'm offending some Lakers fans right now. Um, that, that could be so much fun. Uh, they're just, they're spreading this gospel of peace, and, uh, uh, but then they, they break up. Follow the story from where it is at the first. And you remember Paul. Paul's the one we said a few weeks ago that maybe he's been practicing perfectionism and he's got to learn to, to fall in love with perfect love as he sees it in Jesus. And this is the scales falling from his eyes and he's been following his own perfectionism of the law, but that's left him really hollowed out. But maybe it's falling in love with perfect love that he sees in Jesus and that, that's what he wants to live out. But then you got to get to know Barnabas. Barnabas is amazing. Barnabas, if you go back, read the beginning of Acts, Barnabas, uh, he's seen this early Christian movement, and it's, and it's really beautiful to him, and, and, and he sells his family's estate, its farm, and, and he gives it to this early Jesus movement. And then he starts spending time with the disciples, and they, they change his name from Joseph to Barnabas. And Barnabas means encourager. <laughs> Do you have a Barnabas in your life? Do you have somebody who encourages you? Someone who believes in you when you don't believe in yourself? Somebody who knows you when you don't know yourself? Are you a Barnabas to somebody? Are you encouraging somebody who needs it right now? Barnabas, he comes along too, and Paul comes on the scene. He's had this experience of, of Christ Jesus, of, of becoming a new creation. Of, and, and, he comes, and, and Paul comes to the disciples and says, hey, hey, I want to be a part of this. And the disciples are like, mm -mm, we know who you are. Uh, you're the guy killing Christians. Uh, no, nah, no, nah, we, we, nah, we got nothing for you here. Uh, but Barnabas steps in. And Barnabas says, I, I know him. He's a, he's a changed man. He, he's one of mercy and justice and love and a follower in the way of Jesus. And Paul's accepted in. Barnabas is a friend to him. He, he steps in when Paul can't do on his own. And here's the amazing part. The, the, the early disciples, they send Barnabas out on his first mission. And Barnabas says, Paul, will you come with me? Paul goes, and, and they go to the city named Antioch. And, and it's there that they just have a flourishing ministry. And, and it's there that we read in Acts it's the first time that actually the word Christian is used to name the congregation the way you may identify as your primary form of identity as being a Christian is a product of this flourishing, lovely relationship that they have. The way Scripture says is that they're brought together by the Holy Spirit. They're led together. Here's where I want to get into something really important. Is how do you know that you've got a relationship or friendship that you're led to? Because there's two kind of ways that we have friendships. There's ones that we let happen, and there's ones that we're led to. There's friendships that we allow, and friendships that find or make us accountable to who we're supposed to be. 
Now, the friendships that we let happen, they're not always bad. I mean, they're just sometimes just passive things. You got a class with somebody, you, you enjoy watching a certain team with somebody, you got some shared interest that's great. And it's just kind of a passive thing. It's more about proximity than friendship. But nah, friendships that you're led to, oh, you know them when they're real friendships. It's because of the friendships that, that grow you, stretch you, ones that make you come more into who you're supposed to be. They're the relationships that mature you. They're not just simply encouraging relationships. They're honest relationships. I love what that passage from Proverbs 27 says. It says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wonderful are the wounds of a friend, but profuse are the kisses of an enemy. It's, friendships are those of somebody who tells you the truth. Somebody who helps you mature. Friendships are not friendships based on shared bad habits on a Friday night. No, friendships are the ones that grow you in compassion, grow you in maturity. Paul later on in 1 Corinthians is going to get at what real maturity looks like. And he says, when I was a child, I thought I was a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. And the putting away childish things is becoming a more loving person. Patience, kindness, perseverance. Do you have friendships that grow you that way? Because those aren't the friendships that you're simply letting happen. Those are ones that are like led to by God. Paul, Barnabas, they're practicing this. They, they go out on their first mission and, and they're, they're embodying this new way of being in the world of generosity, of love. It's been there before, but it's been reawakened now in this Jesus movement. And, and they're holding this gospel of peace and there's this flourishing of the gospel in the Mediterranean world. And, and it, they come back to Antioch and, and they're there for a while and, and, and Barnabas says to Paul, hey, hey, let's go visit, revisit those communities. Let's go re revisit our friends. And Paul says, yeah, let's do that. And oh, here's where the trouble starts. Barnabas says, hey, you know what would be great? Let's take John Mark with us. And the scripture says that they, did, that they had a violent disagreement. It's not just a misunderstanding. It's like four-letter words back and forth. Here's where I want to move the message to move from what makes for good friendships about growth and who we're called to be to what really damages relationships. And it starts with this third person coming in. And it's not the third person. It's what the third person awakens within those who are already in relationship. You know, the third wheel comes in. And it always makes things a little more difficult in, in the relationship. But it's, it's not really about the person. It's about how, what the person coming into the relationship makes, makes us have to deal with inside of ourselves. Let's go into this. Who is this John Mark that Barnabas has asked to come in? Well, it's his cousin. Uh, and John Mark is also the son to the woman who is the benefactor to Peter's ministries. All these relationships, it's like a soap opera. It's all going on. But most importantly, if you go back to chapter 13, stay with me, this is amazing. On the mission of Paul and Barnabas, they stop in Paphos, and John Mark is with them. And they begin to move on, and John Mark says, I can't do this anymore. And he goes home to Jerusalem. And here they are going on their next mission, and Barnabas says, let's give him a second chance. Let's give him another try. And Paul says, no. Now to Paul's credit, you've had somebody, I bet, in your life that has betrayed you, and you say, no, we're not doing that again. But Barnabas, the one whose name is encourager, the one who gave up his estate for this Christian movement, he's going to practice some forgiveness. And I want to push this a little further. How come Paul can't do it? The central part of the gospel, this forgiveness, and how hard is a relationship in, with somebody who can't forgive? Let's go into two things that sometimes end friendships so well. And the first is, and I'm getting this from another pastor, Howard John Wesley, when he looked on this scene, he says, it's like a question. It, is it that Paul has to be right? It, does this relationship depend on him getting his way? 
Now there's this conflict with Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15, but there's another place where there's conflict between them, and it's, it's in Galatians. Go check this letter out later, too. They're on their mission in Galatia, and, and Peter shows up. You know, remember Peter who I was just talking about? Peter and Paul have never gotten along. And, uh, and Peter says to this early mission, he says, no, 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 you, you see, uh, Jews and Gentiles, non-Jews, they need to eat separately. It's, it's making too much conflict. And, 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 and Barnabas agrees with Peter. And Paul can't stand it. Paul can't stand that Barnabas doesn't think just like him. How many relationships are ruined because somebody has to be right all the time? How many relationships are ruined because someone says, you've got to think just like me and you've got to like the same people that I like? Uh, I may be naive, but I think one of the beauties of the chapel community is that when we're doing it our best is that we're bending together. It's not conformity of thought. It's actually diversity of thought. As we pursue and follow after Jesus, we realize that uh, there's, so, there's so much room for dissent and disagreement so long as we're, we're looking forward together. We're, these relationships that we have in here, aren't, they're fun, but, th- but they're based on moving forward together. We're trying to grow together, and, and, and that means that we allow disagreement with one another. Is there room for that in this world? Because there is nothing that will crush compassion like conformity of thought. Of saying you need to think like me. It'll crush relationships and friendships. What's another thing that may ruin relationships? Well, there's this moment. There's this moment in um, Paul and Barnabas' ministry where they're in this foreign land and um, and uh, they've healed somebody. And, and the natives of that foreign land, they're amazed. And, and they're in this Greco-Roman world. They know the Greek myths well. They, 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 they believe that Paul and Barnabas are Hermes and Zeus, respectively. Now, now if you've forgotten your Greek mythology, get into this, because Hermes, you may remember, is a messenger of the gods. He's a god, but he's a messenger. He's a heralder of the god. He, he comes to speak so that the other gods may enter. But Zeus, Zeus is the big god. There's always this temptation when you're in relationship with someone that you may feel like you're in their shadow. Is this what happens to Paul? Is it, could there be some jealousy creeping in? Could there be some envy creeping in? This is such a temptation in all of life, but I think it could happen in college, probably perhaps more than anything. I'm out on another walk with a student just last week, and she says, this competition for grades is killing me. We, it seems like we pretend we're friends, but what I feel like we're becoming are frenemies, which is on the surface we applaud one another, but somewhere deep down we hope that you have misfortune, because when you have misfortune, it makes me feel better about myself. Ugh. We kind of live in this place of envy and jealousy. If like someone gets anointing or blessing, we feel like it's our own destruction. What is that? You know what it is? It's the realization that jealousy and envy isn't about a problem with the other person. It's about a problem with my own self. Because the heart of jealousy and envy is insecurity. And insecurity will ruin relationships. Is this... What causes the defriending of Paul and Barnabas? Paul's own insecurities creeping up. They have a violent disagreement and have to go the other way. I love it how Howard John Wesley says, he says, the Holy Spirit brings them together. They're they're formed in faith, but they break up in their feelings. May you not lose good friendships by speaking harsh words in your feelings. Here's the thing that God does with this, and it's quite amazing. There, were gonna be, there was going to be one mission trip. Now there's two. <laughs> now there's this gospel of peace, not in, not in one mission, but two. Now there's practice resurrection, not in one mission, but two. And it's this thing that God does again and again, what we mean for evil sometimes, God's going to use for good. And here's where I want to end it. This is amazing. Go to 1 Corinthians, and there, this is when Paul's writing a letter later on in his ministry, and, and he praises Barnabas. Talks about the good that Barnabas is doing. Talks about the wonderful preaching that Barnabas is doing. 
And it's as if he can see the regret and the desire for reconciliation. (laughs) He's gone further down the line. He's matured more. He's sought perfect love again more. He's beginning to practice again and again, putting away childish things. So for you, may you not only look for the friends that are going to grow you in compassion, who are going to take you not just to a place of being fun. May it be fun, but may it be a relationship that takes you forward. May it mature you. And may you be the kind of person who does that. And may you do that by being on the lookout for those things that creep up within us, needing people to agree with us constantly, or needing affirmation for our own insecurities that can ruin relationships. May you not simply unfriend people, but may you follow Jesus into the world to be the kind of friend you're called to be. Amen. Still